Uh, today I have the great pleasure of introducing uh, Mr. David Margolik. Margolik. Um, David Margolik graduated from the University of Michigan and Stanford Law School. David Margolik is a longtime contrib contributing editor at Vanity Fair and previously at Newsweek, Portfolio, and the New York Times. As a law reporter for the Metropolitan Section of the New York Times, he would then go on to serve as its legal affairs correspondent. During his time with the New York Times, Mr. Margolik covered such trials as uh, Mr. Margolik covered the trials of O.J. Simpson, Lorena Bobbitt, and William Kennedy Smith. In his 15 years with the Times, he would be nominated four times for the Pulitzer Prize. His own work has also appeared in the New York Times uh, Review of Books. Some of his works include Beyond Glory, Joe Lewis versus Max Schmeling, A World on the Brink, Strange Fruit, The Biography of a Song, and The Predator Priest, which is about a family's long quest to bring a pedophile priest to justice. He is currently writing a book on Sid, on Sid Caesar's Your Show of Shows for Next Book's Jewish Encounter series. He also remains a frequent contributor to the New York Times Book Review. He has taught at the New York University's Department of Journalism and lives in New York City. Please help me in welcoming Mr. David Margolik. Well, thank you, Ray John, for that nice introduction. I really should make that a little bit shorter, I think. Um, take out some of those superfluous accolades. Um, uh, I want to thank all of you guys for coming here. I know that, you know, that in some instances your presence is perhaps a bit coerced. Um, your teachers assigned you to be here, but looking out at the crowd, there's a very healthy diversity of uh, demog demographic diversity here. So not all of you are here because you have to be here. So I'm very, I'm, I'm, I'm flattered by that. I just want to, as they say on an airplane, you know, if you're not, if you're not flying to Boston, you're on the wrong flight. I just want to remind you that I'm not Jeb Bush. Um, for those of you who were expected to, to hear, I, I gather he's in the neighborhood, and uh, I don't want to disappoint you. Um, um, and uh, though I'm happy to answer questions about Lorena Bobbitt, I don't, you know, I think that we have more important things to talk about today. Um, anyway, I just. I just want to, uh, again, say how much I appreciate seeing all of you out here. Um, you have to realize that writing a book is sometimes, is, is usually a lonely pursuit and often a very time-consuming pursuit. This book took me 12 years to do. Um, I don't want you to think that, that I'm, you know, that I work glacially or that I'm somehow imp Im impaired in some way. You look at the book and you think, this is a very short book to have spent 12 years on. Um, I didn't work full time on the book for 12 years, but from, but from the moment that I conceived of the book to the moment that it came out, uh, 12 years passed. And uh, um, as jaded as you think that writers are about the work that they do, and I know that a lot of the students here are in writing classes, there's never anything quite like getting people to react to what you write. It's a very special thing. And, uh, you know, even getting a note from an individual reader is very special to somebody who's labored on something for as long as, as I've labored on this or any other book that I've written. So I take this as, uh, this, is, this is like a victory lap for me um, to be able to speak to all of you about this. Um, I want to I start by reading a small portion of the book. One of the, one of the occupational hazards of giving programs like this is giving readings that are too long and that put people to sleep. And uh, I assure you that what I'm going to read you um, is very short. It's really, it's really just the beginning of the book the very introduction. I think before I do that, I'm going to get rid of this. Thanks. I'll roll my sleeves up and, as Ed Schultz says, let's go to work. Um, those of you, I, I, I'm not, there, there will be no pop quiz at the end of all of this, and those of you who have read the book already or at least started the book, will recognize this because this is the very beginning of the book. Um, and I think it sort of sets the stage nicely for what, what follows. In 
It's called, it's the prologue, and it's called Two Dresses. Early in the morning of September 4th, 1957, two girls in Little Rock, Arkansas, each 15 years old, dressed for school. On a block of black families nestled in the west side of town, in the small brick house she shared with her parents and five brothers and sisters, Elizabeth Eckford put on a skirt that her older sister and she had made just for this day. The immaculate white cotton pique felt cool and soft to the touch. When Elizabeth and Anna, who had labored over it for several weeks, had run out of fabric, they trimmed the deep hem with navy blue and white gingham. The new skirt's double rows of gathers made it seem to have tiny pleats, and it appeared especially crisp because Elizabeth had ironed it one last time the night before. Buoyed by the petticoat she wore underneath, it encircled her tiny waist like a bell, one that rang out the, t the tidings of new beginnings. Fashionable and yet modest, descending well below her knees, the pretty skirt was complemented by the rest of what she had chosen to wear that morning, the plain white blouse, which she'd also made, the loafers, the bobby socks. She could just as easily have been going to church, and in a way she was, because for Elizabeth, learning was much more meaningful and useful than prayer. A few miles away in a house very much like Elizabeth's, but in a neighborhood that was all white, Hazel Bryan selected something very different. It was a sleek dress of cool mint green with a triangular white sash at the top pointing suggestively to her bosom and a ribbon tied provocatively around her midriff. She'd, she'd bought it a few months earlier at one of the classy department stores downtown, maybe Blass or Pfeiffer's, with around 10 of the scarce dollars her mother earned making light bulbs at Westinghouse. Hazel wasn't signaling the start of an earnest new undertaking so much as making a fashion statement, taking her cues from Marilyn Monroe, Jane Mansfield, Elizabeth Taylor, and the other movie stars she followed. Hazel hoped to show off her petite figure, to look older and more sophisticated and maybe more promiscuous than she really was. She wanted to impress her girlfriends, but with any luck, the boys forever hovering around her would notice too that the dress was a mite too tight would help. She'd worn the dress before, probably earlier in the summer. Then again, for Hazel, this day wasn't quite as special as it was for Elizabeth. Like all of the white kids, she'd begun school the day before, unperturbed by the soldiers who encircled it, and she had been at this particular school for a year already. Two girls, one black, one white, born less than four months apart, each about to begin 11th grade. Within a few minutes of each other, they set out for the same destination, Little Rock Central High School. They did not know, nor in the world of the South in the 1950s, would they ever have encountered each other before, except perhaps when they rode the same buses or passed on a downtown street or sat on different levels in a local movie theater. But within an hour or so, they would, and from that moment on, their lives would be inextricably intertwined. For long after that, as long, in, as long, in fact, as the tortured saga of relations between the races in the United States and everywhere else still mattered, or as long when it came right down to it, as people can see, they would be linked. When Hazel got home that afternoon, she took off the dress and changed into something more comfortable boys jeans perhaps, they didn't make them yet for girls, and hung it up for the next time. Doubtless there would be many next times, da dances, dates, more school days to put it on. But when Elizabeth removed her skirt that night, then folded it up and handed it to her mother, she already knew she would never wear it, nor even want to see it again. As everyone else was coming to recognize it, for a time, that simple cotton skirt was just about the most famous piece of clothing in the world. Elizabeth set out to forget about it. It promptly went into the attic, and no one, Elizabeth included, ever laid eyes on it again. So that's, that's the, the way that the book begins. I'm sort of indebted 
to a, a, a poet friend of mine who read a rough draft of the book and originally, like a journalist, I just started the book at the, at the beginning, you know, with just sort of building it up chronologically and she said, you have to pull that section on the dresses out and start it with it because it's all there. And I went to somebody at the Fashion Institute to get her to analyze what the dresses looked like and what the fashions were of the day and all of that. Um, I wanted, I, wanted to, I wanted to use those dresses as metaphors as fully, without pushing it too far, as fully as I possibly could. And, uh, and I'm pleased that I started it that way. Anyway, so the, you all see the picture, the picture that's behind, behind me here. If you're anything like me, you know this picture. I mean, long before you picked up my book, for those of you who have picked up my book, um, this picture is just something that we all know. It's just a picture that you encounter, probably even the, even the kids here got it in their high school history books. It's just one of those pictures that everybody sees at one time or another. Sometimes I'm asked, when was the first time you ever saw this picture? And it's really impossible to say. It's just one of these things that you see growing up. It's like the picture of the Vietnamese girl with no clothes on, being who'd just been burned by napalm running down the road after an American bombing. It's just one of those, or the picture of the, of the soldiers um, uh, with the flag at Iwo Jima, hoisting the flag at Iwo Jima. It's just one of these images that you, that you just, once you see it, it's engraved in your mind and you never forget it. And so I must have seen it when I was very young and it always made an enormous impression on me. I never expected to write a book about it. That was, that was um, like the happiest accidents. I mean, you, you can plan books for years and plot and, and, and finding a book topic that you want to devote yourself to because living, writing a book is really like living with someone and it better be somebody you like. Um, and it better be on a topic that you like. And the idea of writing on this never occurred to me. It was just part of my consciousness. But I went to Little Rock um, when I was writing for Vanity Fair, I went to Little Rock to do a story um, about Paula Jones. Um, for those of you who remember who Paula Jones is or was, um, and those of you who don't know who Paula Jones is or was, I, you're, it's not important necessarily. Um, you're not missing a great deal. Anyway, I went to Little Rock to interview Paula Jones and uh, for some reason that baffles me, Paula Jones did not want to be interviewed by me for Vanity Fair. So the story never materialized. Um, but of course, I knew about Little Rock, um, and I knew about this picture, and I felt that I should make a pilgrimage to the high school, to Little Rock Central High School, this iconic building, again, almost as famous as this picture, this high school that looks so much like a high school, like the typical high school. Um, I felt I should go over there and see it. I kind of had a thrill driving even down the highway and seeing a sign that said Little Rock Central High School Historical Site off the highway in Little Rock. And you can tell that things have changed when you, when, when you see a sign like that, how much Little Rock has changed. I mean, this was not the kind of thing that Little Rock wanted to talk about for many years, and many people in Little Rock still don't want to talk about this, but um, it was, it's really a sign of changing political power in this country in a way that Little Rock Central High School is now a national historic site. And of course, it didn't hurt that Bill Clinton was president and was from Arkansas and had been profoundly influenced by these kids in Little Rock and what they had done. So I went over to the high school and um, um, across the street from the high school, again, for those of you who haven't gotten past page eight or whatever in the book, this will all be new to you. Um, across the street from the high school is the ga what, was, what was originally a mobile station, the gas station on the, on the street leading to the high school. It was a gas station in 1957. And now it's a mu it was at that point a museum, a Central High School Historical Museum. It had been converted. And as soon as you walk into the museum, you see this picture. Again, to the consternation and unhappiness of the people of many of the people of Little Rock who only want to forget about all of this. There is this picture staring at you. This picture of Elizabeth Eckford with Hazel Brian Massery yelling behind her. And I wasn't surprised to see the picture there because the picture really encapsulates 
not just what happened in Little Rock, but it encapsulates the civil rights movement, really. I mean, it, you know, it's all, it's all in this picture. I mean, the, the, the sort of the dignity and stoicism and resignation and determination and sadness in Elizabeth Eckford's face to the extent that you can see it because it's partly hidden behind sunglasses. But if you study it, and if you write a book, if you study something as long as I have, you, you look at this picture many times, and every time you see it, you see something new in it. And there's, a, there's an awful lot to see in her face and her bearing, her posture, and all of this. Um, that encapsulates one half of the civil rights uh, story in America. For one thing, it, enca it encapsulates just the, the disproportionate power in America at that point. I mean, as you see, she's all alone. There's no one else around there to help her. Um, of course, the story was that all of the black kids in the Little Rock Nine were supposed to have gone to school together that morning, um, but Elizabeth's family didn't have a telephone, so she never got the message that she was supposed to have reported to the home of the local, the head of the, uh, the, the head of the local NAACP. And so she very naively and idealistically putting on her dress and going to school very hopefully headed off by herself that day, which is why she's alone. And then you have the face of Hazel. And you know, what better symbol is, what better symbol is there of what these black school children were facing that morning? I mean, what better encapsulates the hatred, the anger, the absolute fury of the white population that these African American children were being forced down their throats and into their, their proud local high school by the federal government. Send, you know, the federal government forcing the South to change its way of life almost 100 years after the Civil War had ended. And so there was the picture, and it didn't surprise me that it was the first thing that you saw. But not far from the picture was another picture, um, a picture of two grown women, one white, one black, not in black and white, but in color, obviously a picture of a much more recent vintage, um, two grown women, women in their 50s, standing together, um, smiling at one another, looking like old friends. And I was absolutely amazed to see this picture, and it was, on a, it was on a poster that said reconciliation. And if you looked at the picture carefully, in the, in the upper right-hand corner of this poster was this picture, the original picture. Um, and the theme was, the, the story was, it was apparent from the, the poster itself, that many years later, in fact, 40 years later, on the 40th anniversary of the events depicted here, Elizabeth and Hazel had actually come together um, through a complicated series of maneuvers. They'd been brought back together again and had somehow, at least, at least as far as one could see from the picture, had reconciled and were standing there very amicably talking to one another. And I thought to myself as a journalist, and really just as a, curi as a curious citizen of this country who cares about race relations and racial history, how did this ever happen? I mean, how did we get from the first picture to the second picture? What could possibly, what could possibly have happened? And how does, one ex how does one explain that? And I thought, this is a more interesting story than Paula Jones, or even Lorena Bobbitt for that matter. Um, and I wanted, to, I wanted to know how it came to be that these two people had come back together. And so that's, that was the genesis of the book. I mean, the, the original picture was taken in 1957. The reconciliation quote-unquote quote unquote, picture was taken in 1997. I went to Little Rock in 1999, and, uh, I, started to, and I started to ask questions and, uh, about how this poster had come to be. And I was told that, that um, the two women were around and that they were making appearances together and that if I wanted to see them, it could be arranged. And they had, a, they had somebody who was actually handling publicity for them because they had hoped to do a book together. And I called her and the next thing I knew, I was at a diner outside of Little Rock 
um, having lunch with Elizabeth and Hazel and Hazel's husband. And I got to tell you, it's sort of an extraordinary thing to be sitting in the presence of these two iconic figures. I mean, they were grown women, but there are, it was really sort of amazing to me that I mean, even, to, even to be sitting at the same table with them was amazing. Um, there's one more thing I remember about that. Um, it was at a barbecue joint. That's not the other thing that I remember. The barbecue was not particularly good that day. Um, but what I remember was that Elizabeth insisted on picking up the tab. And again, those of you who've read the book will know this story, but um, this is what you're supposed to do when you go on television. You're supposed to mention the book every two minutes so that no one ever forgets that there's a book, you know, you're, that you're not on television just for your health. You're pushing a book. Um, but there was one, one more thing that, that, I, that I write about, which is that Elizabeth insisted on picking up the tab because she had, her, her, she had her first credit card. This is a woman in her 50s. She had never had a credit card before. She had never used one before. She wanted to see if the, if the damn thing actually worked, whether you could actually hand this piece of plastic to somebody, to the waitress, and just sign your name and walk out of a restaurant without leaving any cash. I mean, she couldn't believe that this kind of thing could go on. She was just incredulous, and she felt that she had to test it. Now, if I'd been thinking about that, I would have realized here was a sign of the kind of life that Elizabeth had led. I mean, one of, the, one of my missions now was to tell the story about from 1957 to 1999, the kinds of lives that each of these women had led. And the, the credit card was surely a telltale sign of the kind of insularity of Elizabeth Eckford's life. I mean, there was, that was a very telling thing about her. And part of my mission was to try to explain exactly why something like that was the truth. What, you know, what, did, what did that symbolize? When I went to talk to Elizabeth and Hazel, um, had I been really attentive, I would have been able to see that, that there was a certain tension that had developed between them by the time I got to them. You can imagine that when they came together, all of Little Rock breathed a sigh of relief. When they came together for the 40th anniversary, it was practically a bigger deal than having Bill Clinton, who was by, by then president, speak at the high school. To bring these two archetypal antagonists together, um, the whole town of Little Rock was relieved. Little Rock had been maligned for 40 years as like Selma, Alabama or Philadelphia, Mississippi, one of these places that symbolized racial hatred and intolerance. And if these two people could come together, maybe it meant that Little Rock uh, had turned a corner and Little Rock had finally become a, a place of racial reconciliation. Well, of course, it's never that simple. And the, day that I, the first day that I spent with Elizabeth and Hazel, um, you could sort of see that there, were some, there was some underlying tension be between them. I think I was so, so, so in awe of being in their presence that I wasn't so attentive to it. But I remember asking Hazel, you know, how are the two of you doing? And Hazel said, well, let's just say that the honeymoon is over and we're taking out the garbage. Now, I think probably a more alert reporter might have, a light might have gone on in my head um, when I heard that. Um, but I, it, it didn't really register. I was just taking notes, and I assumed that everything was all right between the two of them. Um, the story I learned, I learned very early on, I think even that first day when I was sitting around talking to them, that the story had, a, had an interesting twist right from the very beginning. Um, it turned out that in 1962, which is only five years after the picture that was up there, uh, was taken, um, Hazel, who by then was 20 years old, Hazel, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to forget that Hazel and Elizabeth were both 15 years old when this picture was taken. And one of the great curses that Hazel has faced all her life is that people assume that she was older than 15. She dressed to look older than 15. She wanted to look very mature and sexy. And, uh, and so for ever since then, she's been judged as somebody who was older than 15 years old. I mean, she looks like an adult. And so people judge her much more harshly than they would normally had they known how young she was at the time. 
And within five years, Hazel, I mean, one of the ironies of the story is that Hazel was very eager, as you can see from the picture, Hazel was very eager to keep Elizabeth out of Central High School. That's why she was there that morning. She was there to say, nigger, go home. She was there to say, nigger, go back to Africa. Um, she was very eager to keep Elizabeth from entering the school that day. But because of the notoriety of this picture, which ran all over the world, her parents actually were worried about Hazel's well-being, and they pulled her out of the school. So Hazel was never actually in school with any of the Little Rock Nine. She went to a different school near Little Rock, and she never graduated. So it's one of the paradoxes of the story that this girl who is so eager to keep the black girl out of the school never even went, never, not only didn't stay in the school, but didn't graduate from high school herself. And she didn't graduate because at the age of 16 or 17, she got married, and she already had a couple of kids. She was 20 years old. She was living in a trailer in 1962, and she was watching television, one of these early, you know, the early televisions with the rabbit ears, um, and could see what was happening in the South, and could see the, the German shepherds attacking the black protesters, and could hear Dr. Martin Luther King. And she thought, you know, I made my own contribution to this terrible situation. And I, and I have these little kids, and these little kids are going to grow up, and they're going to realize, they're going to see this picture the way that everybody else is going to see this picture. And they're going to realize that that's their, one day they're going to learn that's their mother. They're only two or three years old now, but one day they're going to learn that was their mother. And I have, I have some making up and to, I have some making up to do. Um, so she picked up the phone, she looked up Eckford in the phone book, and as a 20-year-old, she called up Elizabeth. Um, and I always like to say, you know, now in the, in the era of Oprah, you know, these reconciliations are highly publicized, and, you know, no, no good deed goes unrecorded and commented on and analyzed endlessly and all of that. In this instance, she was alone, she didn't tell her husband, she didn't tell her minister, um, she just picked up the phone, called up Elizabeth's family, got Elizabeth on the phone, um, and said to her, I'm the girl in the picture, and I just want you to know how sorry I am. It's a pretty extraordinary thing for a, any white woman to do in the South in 1962, a 20-year-old mother calling up and apologizing to Elizabeth. So I think when I heard that story, um, I realized that Writers like to find stories that are more complicated than meet the eye. And most stories are more complicated. That's the beauty of writing. You can always, there are always surprises or wrinkles or, or facts, unexpected facts and, and subtleties and complexities. And it would have been very easy just to write about this monstrous girl and leave it at that and this heroic black woman and leave it at that and just write that story. But of course, the longer that you stay with something and the more layers you unpeel, um, the, more, you know, the more interesting and complex the story becomes. Um, and I think that I, I could realize, I realized very early on that this was a story, I, my first book was, um, I mention this only because it's kind of a local, my first book was about the fight over the Johnson & Johnson fortune in Princeton, the, the Band-Aid, the guy with the Band-Aid money who left all of his money to his Polish maid. And I mention that because I think that Becton Dickinson or Fairleigh Dickinson or all these drug families knew one another. Um, and it was a, a very, it was a very bloody story and it was a story filled with, you know, it was a, a fight over a half a billion dollars and, and, and um, very gory and colorful and embarrassing to a lot of people. Um, but it was a hard book to write because it was hard to find anybody to admire in it. It was really kind of an ugly story. It's, much pr it's vastly preferable to write a book about two people you really admire. And I knew that I would admire Elizabeth Eckford because she ha she's a woman of enormous intelligence and dignity and you're inclined to admire somebody who en endured the ordeal that she did that morning and, the, uh, and, and what she faced that year in school the harassment that all of the Little Rock Nine were subjected to. Um, there's, a, there's a PBS documentary on tonight about Daisy Bates, who supervised 
the, the, the black children that year, and they were, they were subjected to, you know, things were thrown at them, they were thrown down the stairs, they were scalded in the shower, glass was thrown on the shower floor so they would step on it. Um, I mean, they were, they were subjected to the worst indignities imaginable. And, uh, and somehow she came out of it, Elizabeth Eckford came out of it. I knew that her story was inherently heroic. Um, Hazel's story wasn't so clearly heroic, but what she did in 1962, it seemed to me, was a clue to her character. And I thought that this was somebody that I could also admire, and so I was curious about both of them. Um, I had to be a little bit patient, however, because, and this is in instructive too about the realities, for those of you who are interested in journalism, um, reporters, when you're, first getting to, when you're first getting to meet people, um, it's very important, the impression that you make on them. People are sizing you up. And it turned out that, that the first time that I was with the two of them, I made a comment. I don't remember making this comment, but Hazel insists that I did, um, where I turned to Elizabeth and I made some comment about how, a, a reference to how blacks and Jews, blacks like her and Jews like me, sort of were historically aligned, you know, that there were blacks who were, you know, the, the Jewish civil rights workers who went down south and the Jews who helped start the NAACP and all of that. And there's been, historically, it, the relationship is frayed now, but historically there's always been this kind of tie between two minority groups. And it was at that moment that Hazel felt, um, this was the first time I met her, that I, that she wanted, they wanted somebody to tell their story, but they had decided that, uh, she had decided that I, as a Jew, could not be objective about telling this story. That I was going to take the black person's side, and that I would not be an honest storyteller. She sort of got wise to me, she thought. And so from that moment on, in 1999, for the next eight years, she did not speak to me. All right, so Elizabeth and Hazel almost turned into only Elizabeth. Hazel would not talk to me until, until 1996 or 1997, until 1997. And that was only after um, she had read the excerpt of my story that had run in Vanity Fair and she could see that I didn't, I wasn't going to be yet another white person coming down there and criticizing her and just, and, and describing her as a redneck or a cracker and somebody who would try to tell her whole story and to talk about her apology and all of that. And when she realized that, and once um, another woman who had also been writing, had, had also uh, been working with her, had, tried, had convinced her to talk with me, only at that point did she talk to me. So for my first, the first seven years that I was working on the book, I was talking only to Elizabeth. And shortly after I met with the two of them, the two of them stopped talking to one another. And this was, I mean, this was what I picked up the first time that I spoke with them, that there were tensions that were developing and that the idea that they could magically bury the hatchet um, was just, it was, a, it was a pipe dream. I mean, the idea that, you know, that America is post-racial or that two people with this history could just, for the sake of the cameras, come together and that there would be no misunderstandings between the two of them was really, it was, it was, uh, it was, a, it was a fantastic and unrealistic notion. And so at that point I realized that my story would have a third part. I mean, the first part is 1957, is what happened, what led them to be in that picture together. The second part was what happened between 57 and 97 to bring them back together again in the very separate lives that they led. And the third part would be to explain why they split apart, what the misunderstandings were between the two of them, um, and why, to this day, um, they have still not spoken to one another for more, they've not, at this point, they've not spoken to one another for 10 years. So I was going back and forth between the two of them. Uh, the last time that they spoke was September 11th of 2001. They had already stopped talking at that point, but Hazel had, had flown to Massachusetts because she wanted to participate in a program that Coretta Scott King had endorsed and she was hoping to get Mrs. King to bring her and Elizabeth back together again. She was so bothered that they had stopped talking to one another. 
And then 9-11 happened, and she was so frightened, and she had never been in Massachusetts. She'd never been in New England before. She was all alone. She didn't know who, who else to call, and she ended up calling Elizabeth. Because in a way, Elizabeth had become, in the time that they were together, Elizabeth had become one of her best friends. So the story has many, has many different many different components and many different parts, and, and uh, the story continues to play out even today. I mean, the book, every writer, no writer likes to become part of his own story, and it was very tempting to have, to try to arrange some Oprah-esque kind of thing where the two of them would come together and, you know, after having not spoken to one another for 10 years, um, and hug and you know have the audience applaud and it would have been great for sales of the book and all of that but first of all I mean there are a couple of problems with this the first is that the two of them had appeared on Oprah together in 1999 right around the time that I met them and they were as I say they were already having problems together but one thing brought them together they the, both of them found that Oprah was very was very rude to them they had a very bad experience on the Oprah show. They felt, that, they felt that Oprah was very disrespectful to the two of them, that Oprah couldn't accept somehow the idea that the two of them had gotten together and was very brusque with them. Oprah was doing a television show on the most famous photographs of the 20th century, um, and that was one of the pictures. So, you know, she had the couple hugging at Woodstock on together, and she had... The, the girl from Vietnam was on the show, and Elizabeth and Hazel were on the show. And Oprah, and Oprah was, was very mean to them both. And so whenever anybody says to me, you know, boy, I really liked your book, and what a great movie it would make, or a great Oprah show, I know they haven't read the book, because there's a whole, there's a whole section in there about their experiences with Oprah and, uh, um, and how, how disrespected they felt when they left the studio that day. Um, and you might think that, that a Vanity Fair reporter has access to Oprah and can get a comment from her, and I can assure you that it's not so, because I tried to interview Oprah for this, and I never managed to get through. I was kind of hoping, actually, that, you know, that Oprah would be so embarrassed by this that she would stage some, you know, some great uh, public reconciliation on her show, and you know, say mea culpa, and, and say I, I apologize for this, and bring them back together anyway, and then I'd have the best of all worlds, you know, and have them on Oprah anyway, and uh, it would have been great for book sales, but uh, it, was, it, it wasn't meant to be. Um, so, uh, so I was doing a kind of shuttle diplomacy between the two of them going for they, Elizabeth still lives in the house that she left that morning when she went to school still lives in the same house Elizabeth had a terrible ordeal in her life Elizabeth um, was traumatized by the experience of being in the high school that year Elizabeth's family had a history of depression to begin with I think she never got over that year at Central High School. After she got out of Central High School, she tried to kill herself a couple of times. Um, she never married. She had trouble graduating from college. She dropped out of a college and then went back after many years in the Army where, in some cases, she was afraid to leave her base because these bases were in the South, and she was afraid as a black woman to walk anywhere on a southern street. Um, and Elizabeth had a very rough life, never married, had two children without marrying either of the fathers, um, was on disability and PT, was diagnosed with PTSD and was on disability for many years, didn't work, um, just had a, a miserable, difficult, anguishing life. And then at a certain point, as I, as I say in the book, um, she pulled herself out with the help of treatment and the help of, of, and with her own inherent courage and sort of rebounded in the last 20 years of her, in the last, the most recent 20 years of, of her life. And she's become a very articulate spokesman for historic memory. You know, everybody likes to pretty up these stories and everybody likes happy endings and 
Everybody likes revisionist history, and it's very popular now in Little Rock to say that none of this was that bad, and all these people were just complaining and making a big thing out of nothing. And they really didn't have it that bad. And by the way, we were all very friendly to them when they were in the high school. Elizabeth says that there were really there were two kids all year, two white kids all year who spoke to her that year in high school. But now, you know, it's sort of the, the May, everybody came over on the Mayflower, everybody's family came over on the Mayflower. And, every, and, and uh, you know, and everybody and all of the whites were friendly to the black kids that year. Um, and Elizabeth, who was so pathologically afraid of public speaking um, that when she first started to speak to groups like this, she'd have a wastebasket by her side with a hefty bag inside just in case she vo wanted to vomit in the middle of the speech out of fear, just that fear of appearing before people. You know, now has, is much more comfortable and is giving speeches and talking about her experiences. Um, and it's a, very, it's, it's a very inspiring story. And I'll, I'll just end by saying that Hazel's story is inspiring too. And Hazel came a long way. And Hazel, as I said, became the, the picture with the, the reconciliation picture was not just for show, um, but the two of them, as I said, there were these misunderstandings that developed between the two of them after they reconciled. Elizabeth felt that Hazel was never fully candid about what, what had really happened. Hazel refused to denounce her parents or say that she had grown up in a racist environment. There were holes in Hazel's story that Elizabeth found unpersuasive. And Elizabeth started giving Hazel a hard time and embarrassing her in public. And Hazel thought, I don't need this anymore. So Hazel stopped making public appearances. It's actually been a problem for me because a lot of some television shows wanted the two of them to go on, and, ha and Hazel will make no public appearances. Um, she wouldn't go on any shows for me. Um, but the story is not quite over. Um, after the book appeared, Elizabeth wrote Hazel a letter um, apologizing for some of the slights. I mean, it's, it's, it's one of the great ironies of the story that the woman who feels aggrieved now is the white girl in that picture. She's the one who's nursing her wounds. She feels, she feels that by apologizing, the black, the black community didn't believe her and felt that she was cashing in or was an opportunist. The white community resented her because she was a symbol of all of them and they wanted her just to go away. And so she just concluded to hell with this. You know, I've done my best. I'm, I tried to make amends. I've only gotten grief for it. I'm just going to go back to my family, and that's what she's done. So Elizabeth has sent Hazel a letter um, since my book came out. I mean, the book eventually becomes a player in the drama, unavoidably. And Hazel is now weighing how to respond to Elizabeth. And so the last chapter of the story, in a way, has not been written yet. It's, it's still unfolding as, as we speak. And I'll just close by saying that I respect them both. I think that um, I'm very proud of the fact that, that um, they both placed their confidence in me. Even though they weren't talking to one another, they both felt that, that I'd be a worthy person to tell their story. It took Hazel a little bit of time to come around to that point of view, like eight years. But she eventually did. And I think that, I think that they both opened up with me as, as much as they were capable of doing and that in their story lies a lot of the subtleties and complexities about race relations in this country. And there's a lot to, there's a lot to be learned from their experiences separately and together. And I'll just, I'll end on that ambiguous note. Their story is ambiguous. I wish, it, you know, I wish I could report a happy ending. Steven Spielberg would be more likely to make a film out of it if there were a happy ending to this story. But life is not so neat. And a reporter and a writer can't tailor his can't tailor his stories to suit popular tastes. I mean, the book has to, the story is what the story is, and I hope that those of you who have it um, read it, and those of you who don't have it get it. And uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. And and thank and really. Um, I'll just, I'll, thank you, thank you all for coming. I'm, I'm, and, and thank many of you for staying. I'm just very, I'm very touched by this turnout. 
Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Margolik, for uh, speaking with just speaking with us today. And now we are going to have a, a question and answer session. So if you have a question, we ask that you just raise your hand, and uh, either Caesar or myself will come to you and give you the microphone so you can voice your question. Somebody has to ask the first question and break yeah. the ice. That's going to be me. Oh, um, okay. <laughs> Good. Uh, you mentioned that you know the people of Little Rock were you know kind of eager to you know get you know put you know, every, all the events that had happened behind them. Um, if you could just comment briefly or touch on, you know, what the culture at the school is like today. Um, are the, you know, the children still getting along? And, you know, what was yeah, the I'm, You know, I'm not, I'm not an authority on the school today, except to say that by the popular wisdom about the school, Little Rock Central is now more than half black. I mean, again, it's one of the great ironies that the school that was lily white all of these years is now a, mostly a minority school. And many people feel, I mean, the common rap on it, I think the people who run the, the school are very well-meaning and earnest, but they have a real problem on their hands because the school is still very racially divided, even though it's now both groups are under one roof. And, there, you know, many, peop many people feel that, you know, there's a, there's a school for blacks and there's a school for whites in Little Rock Central High School that most of the AP courses are, you know, are taken by whites and there's a, that they're really almost two separate schools. You were saying that, the, that, you, that there was tension caused after you guys met up. Yeah. Um, do you feel you were the cause of that? <laughs> I don't think I was the cause of it at all. I think it, it, it was, I guess, what they would call in the lingo of, of, hel of Obamacare, a pre-existing condition. Uh, um, as I said, they would each give their presentations, and Elizabeth found that Elizabeth found she, Elizabeth is a is a stickler for historic accuracy. She's a very precise woman, and she she demands candor, and she resents people who aren't candid. And she felt that Hazel, there were there were holes in her story, and there were gaps in her story. And she felt that Hazel really hadn't fully reconciled herself to the past and been fully candid w with her or anybody else. For instance, Hazel said that it was only that day that she acted up and the, the picture, that was just a, a one-day aberration. And it turned out that if for those of you who've seen Eyes on the Prize, there's a clip of Hazel being interviewed a day or two later talking to a white reporter and saying, the Negras have their own school, we have our school, they, they, have, they, they shouldn't be here, you know, their school's just as good as ours. And she was rabble-rousing for, you know, not just on this day. I mean, she kept rabble-rousing. And, the, and her failure to admit that to Elizabeth was a sign that she wasn't fully telling the truth. And, there, and as I say, her failure to denounce her own parents and to say that her parents were racist and that she'd grown up in a racist environment um, also, also was a sign that she wasn't being straight. And so sometimes when they would make joint appearances, Hazel would say something and Elizabeth would grab the microphone from her and contradict her. And, you can imagine this is the kind of thing that would build up tensions between two people. And I think that I had, I had nothing to do with it. Um, I, was, um, I just happened to come along when it was brewing, and it soon, it soon started overflowing the pot. And at that point, Hazel, Hazel called Elizabeth and said, I don't want to make any more appearances together. And they stopped talking to one another. And they still have not, they've, as I said, Elizabeth has written this letter, but they've not, they've not had a conversation since September 11th. Uh, yes. Um, I think the people here in the audience would like to know the genesis of this entire historic episode. That is the confrontation between Governor Forbes right. and Eisenhower, who was president, and how it all started. I think they really don't know. I was 14 at the time. I remember very well. The Brown versus the Board of Education case came down in 1954 with the orders to desegregate all schools. The South dragged its feet. Little Rock considered itself more enlightened than a typical Southern city. Little Rock liked to think of itself as part Western and part Midwestern, and it always considered itself, they always used to say, Little Rock is not Birmingham and Arkansas is not Mississippi. So Little Rock, in a way was the victim of its own relatively progressive attitude. It agreed to desegregate its schools before other, other schools did in 1957, but only in a very token, literally a token way, with nine kids in a school of 2,000 people, 2,000 students. 
thereby assuring that every one of these black kids would be by themselves all day long, practically. Governor Faubus resisted the order to desegregate, stationed national guard, state national guardsmen around the school. They were the ones who were blocking the way for Elizabeth and everyone else. Um, so in that picture, the, the, the picture that the famous picture when Elizabeth is walking, Elizabeth has already tried three times to get into the school and the National Guardsmen locked their bayonets and wouldn't let her in. They wouldn't let her pass the line. She didn't realize they were there to keep her out. Um, these were troops that were stationed by Governor Faubus, who was really a political opportunist more than a racist. He was considered a relatively progressive. He had been elected as the more progressive Democrat in the race. Um, therein, Thereafter was the confrontation with President Eisenhower. Um, after, two weeks after this picture was taken, Eisenhower sent in the, 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 the paratroopers from the 101st Air Brigade to, to, in, to uh, 102nd, 101st, 102nd, um, to, um, to open up the school. I mean, to get the, to, to get the protesters out of the way and to escort the students into the school. That was on September. This picture was taken on September 4th. The, the, the paratroopers came in, I think it was on the 22nd or the 23rd, and the, tw the, the 25th was the day that the black kids all got in w under guard of, of, the, of, of the federal paratroopers. And that's when the school was actually finally desegregated, and that's the backdrop to it, of course. It was considered a very controversial move. It was the first time since the Civil War that troops had, that Union troops had been sent into the South, and it was a very controversial move, particularly for a Republican president to make, who was quite conservative in his own right, and he kept the troops there for as short a period as he could, whereupon the, the state National Guardsmen, the same ones who tried to keep the black kids out, were then in charge of protecting them, and that's why all of these events went on all year long in the school. The school administrators looked the other way and effectively 100 or 200 segregationist kids took over the school and just ran amok and did whatever they wanted to do um, and to really tortured these black kids, including Elizabeth. Um, the, I, the, 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 kids, the kids were chosen very haphazardly. Um, they wanted, I mean, they wanted kids who weren't, the black kids, they wanted kids who weren't going to be troublemakers. And they wanted kids who had no connection there. The NAACP had filed a lawsuit a year or two earlier. They didn't want any of the kids who were connected with that. And the, the, the very haphazardness of the selection process is apparent in the, in the fact that they let Elizabeth go. Because Elizabeth is a very vulnerable woman. And, you know, um, Anybody, they wanted Jackie Robinson types who could just take everything and turn the other cheek. And Elizabeth was somebody who was so fragile that, you know, she was going to feel everything very, very acutely. And she never, she really never recovered from it. Uh, did, did that, is that enough of a once over? Thank you for asking the question. Our, ne our next question is right here. Apparently you started writing this book in the late 1990s, is that correct? Yes. What caused it? Was there any single episode that you decided to write about this that was 40 years prior to, the, prior to when you wrote it? Um, well, I mean, really what... Um, the, 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 the book that I had done before this one was about the Billie Holiday song, Strange Fruit, the anti-lynching song. And I kind of liked the idea of... And then the book that I did during this was about the Joe Lewis-Max Schmeling fight, okay? The you know, strange fruit lasts a couple minutes. The Lewis Schmeling fight, the second one, lasted only two minutes and four seconds. This picture was taken in a 60th of a second or 125th of a second. I kind of like the idea of finding small events and putting a microscope over them and sort of seeing all of the different layers and subtleties and emanations from this one thing. Um, so I like the device of writing about one picture and seeing all the different directions in which it goes. You know, I could tell you who a lot of the people in that picture were, okay, for instance. I, everybody I could identify in that picture, I could. Everybody who's in that picture who's still around that I could identify, I interviewed. One of the ringleaders of the segregationist students in that picture, and it's too bad you can't see it, but um, there's a girl with her head turned, okay. 
The only reason that she's not infamous in the way that Hazel is is that her father called her the moment the photographer took the picture. Okay? So her head is turned. You see the back of her head. So no one knows who she is. Okay, even though she made great trouble for the, for, the, for the black students in the school for the rest of the year. All right, I interviewed her. Um, as far as the timing of my doing it, as I say, I went down there to do another story and, and uh, I saw the picture there. And I just, I just knew that, that, that both of these women were still around. Most of the people, when you write about the 30s, it's very hard to find anybody who's still around. When you write about the 50s, it's a little bit easier. And now was the time to do it. In fact, all of the Little Rock Nine were still around. One of them has since died. So this was the time to do this, was the time to do this story. The, the participants were still around. Um, today is, uh, you know, I forgot. Today is the 2nd of February. Th two days ago, Hazel turned 70. All right. Uh, um, last fall, Elizabeth turned 70. You know, everybody's getting older. Now is, you know, now is the time to talk to these people. So I, I, I seize it. I just, I seize the opportunity. I didn't talk to, I'm not sure I'm answering your question. I didn't, I, did, I didn't talk to any publisher. I didn't talk to any editor. I just went off and I, I just started to do the story on my own because I knew that it was a compelling story and I wasn't worried about selling it to someone. I thought that these faces are well enough known and people are curious, curious enough about them that they'll want to know what happened to these two women. And as I said, the story got more and more interesting as it went along because there were all these additional nuances to it, particularly the idea that their stories are braided together and the idea that they ended up not talking to one another after this very public reconciliation only made it both more interesting and more real. Um, now that you have finished your book, are you still going to continue to watch this developing story in hopes of a happy ending? I, I, I still talk to both of them, and I feel as if I need to check in on them. I particularly feel as if I need to check in on Elizabeth, and I've been very delinquent because Elizabeth likes mysteries, and I, I promised to send her a whole package of paperback mystery books, and I haven't done it yet. I, I feel guilty about that. Um, and, I, and she's, she, she became a probation officer, and she's retired now, and she's on a very small fixed income, and I feel as if I should, I need to keep tabs on her. I, I really love her. She's a very special woman. And I, and I Hazel, I have a, 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 a slightly different relationship with, in part because Hazel's not alone. Hazel has a, a husband and three kids and grandkids and great-grandkids. I mean, you know, she got married when she was 16, and her kids got married young, and she's got a huge family. She's got a huge support system in a way. Um, but when Elizabeth, I'll, I'll put it this way, when Elizabeth wrote Hazel, I knew that Elizabeth, Elizabeth told me that she wrote her. And then when, ha when Hazel got the letter and called me up to say, you'll never guess who I heard from, I knew who she'd heard from because I knew that Elizabeth had sent the letter. And Hazel is not sure how to answer the letter. And on the one hand, I want to kibitz and advise her and, and tell her what to say and all of that. On the other hand, this is really their affair. It's not my affair. And I, I've tried to tread lightly. I mean, for the longest time, I guess I didn't finish this story, I never tried to get them together. Um, it was only when we took the picture, for those of you who have the book in your hand, that the, 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 this friend of mine volunteered to go down to take those contemporary pictures of the two of them. And there's a reason why there's a divider between the two pictures, the two contemporary pictures, why we, put, why we, why we separated them, because we were afraid that people would think that they got together. He said, you have, to, you, have, you have to ask them to pose one more time together. For the sake of history, these two should be together one more time. And I said, I really don't want to do that. I don't want to be a player in my own story. And he said, but you've got to do it for the sake of history. So I did it. I asked the two of them. And I guess I've, I won't play this game with you that I've played with some other audiences because I've kind of given away the answer. But one of them agreed to do it and one of them wouldn't do it. And it's, you know, it, it, it's, had I not told you the story, it would, probably wouldn't have occurred to you that it's Elizabeth, the black woman, who's quite willing, who sees her obligation to history 
and was willing to was willing to pose, but it's the white woman who would not pose. So I'm monitoring it, um, but I've kind of resolved not to be not to be overly aggressive about it. I you know or I don't want to I don't want to effectuate some kind of artificial you know rapprochement between these two people. They have to work out their own agreement. And yeah, I'd love it if. You know, they, if, if they appeared together on the Today Show, I would love that, you know. Um, but I can't make that, ha you know, I can't make that happen. And, uh, I mean, if there's somebody else who can make it happen, I'd be very pleased, I would deputize them, but. Do you have any pictures of Hazel? Do I have any pictures of Hazel? Right. Hazel's on the cover of the book. You mean, you mean contemporary pictures of Hazel? Yes, yeah, she's on the cover of the book, and she's on... Um, there's also, there's a picture on the inside, pictures of both of them, contemporary pictures of both of them. Yeah. Thank you for all, these are great. I'm, I'm We're going to take uh, the next question back I'm here. I'm happy to I'm take on. as many as you got. Yes. I'm curious about the relationship with Elizabeth and her teachers. With Elizabeth and her teachers. In, in the high school, yeah. Did she give you any information about that? Yes. Well, she... There's a story in the book about the teacher. There was a, a teacher named, um, uh, God, you know, this is what happens when you, it's been a while. Um, well, anyway, uh, there's a teacher in the book who was a member of the daughter of the, con I'm just having a momentary mind meld. Um, there was a teacher in the book who was a member of the Daughters of the Confederacy. And uh, Elizabeth was very shocked because she took history from her and this teacher said that, you know, Lincoln freed the slaves only for tactical reasons and that the Ku Klux Klan was founded to protect Southern womanhood. And, and this teacher, um, Miss Penton, Emily Penton, thank you. Um, this teacher, um, how many of you remember my weekly reader? You know, I mean, I remember used to smell a particular way when it had, a, had the smell of newsprint. Maybe that got into my blood at that point. Um, when Miss Penton brought, collected money from my weekly reader, she would not take the money directly from Elizabeth. She wouldn't touch her. She made her put the three cents or the nickel or whatever on her desk. So that was her relationship with one teacher. Um, a lot of the teachers in the school were segregationists themselves and were unsympathetic to what was going on. Her homeroom teacher, I think, was reasonably nice to her, and her speech teacher was a real disciplinarian who wouldn't put up with any kind of misbehavior, and Elizabeth liked her, and I did speak to her. She was still around, and I did talk to her. But Elizabeth, as Elizabeth describes it, she sat on the periphery of every class. You know, no one would sit with her. So there'd be, you know, three, the three front rows would be filled or whatever, and she'd be in the fourth row or whatever. She was always by herself, except in the speech class where there was this sympathetic teacher and there were two white kids who befriended her. And many years later, she was reunited with both of them. And it was a, it was a very powerful, mo powerful moment for them all. And it was a boy and a girl. And the man said that he had no idea. That was just the way that he was raised, you know. I mean, I, I, I often wonder, I mean, there's a wonderful quote this won't take as long as the first reading. There's a quote from Frederick Douglass that I put at the very beginning of the book, which says, my interest in any man is objectively in his manhood and subjectively in my own manhood. And to me, that, that's, that's just, to me, a way of asking myself what I would have done. I mean, in, in studying something like this, you try to put yourself into the position of the people back then and you wonder, you know, I wonder in what group of students would I have been in? I mean, would I have been in that very small, tiny group of students that befriended these kids and were called nigger lovers and who were harassed and whose families' businesses were boycotted? Would I have been willing to do that? Probably not, but I don't, I don't know. I'd like to think I would have, but I'm not delusional. It would have taken a lot of courage. I don't know whether I would have had that courage. You know, would I have been in the group of 200 kids that were, that were scalding these kids and throwing them into lockers and knocking them down the stairs? I know I wouldn't have been in that group. 
I probably would have been part of the great silent majority that just looked the other way. But I think it's a valuable question. It's a valuable question to ask, you know, and, that, and, and it, applies even to the, it, it applies even to the whites. You know, it's why I think Hazel eventually came around. I didn't, I tried to be understanding of the people who made trouble that year too. You know, and again, there are complexities. I remember I placed an, I placed an ad in the, in the Little Rock paper um, saying, anybody who remembers anything about all of this, you know, please get in touch with me. And uh, you, you always hear from a few people anyway. And there was one girl who said, I'll never forget my father coming home that night, the night that this picture was taken. And he said, I don't want those niggers in school with my kids either, but they didn't treat that little girl right. And I found that very touching. I mean, here was, he was a segregationist, but he knew that the way that Elizabeth was treated that morning was wrong. So there are, you know, there, there are layers, to, I, mean, I, keep, I keep repeating that phrase, there are just subtleties to this story um, that, you know, the, the subtleties to the story are endless. And uh, I, the longer that I'm in journalism, the more impatient I get with simplified stories. Like you can go see the help and it makes you feel good. And it's like, it's just, a, it's a crock. It's just a crock. And yet that's what films are made of. You know, the, I mean, the idea that, that black domestics could have done what they did, you know, in serving that meal, that pie to that woman, you know, this is, it just, it, you know, it's just, it's, it's a terrible disservice to history to give people the impression that, that, or that there'll be a white girl taking it all down and interviewing them. There was no white kid doing that in Little Rock in 1957. So there wouldn't have been any white kid in Mississippi in 1963 doing that either. Mr. Margolis, uh, this will be the last question right here. And my answers are probably too long. I'm sorry, for, I'm sorry for those of you we won't get to. Could you give us a little background on the, the two individuals that befriended Elizabeth uh, the day the picture was taken? You know, I don't, I, I don't really, the two individuals who befriended her, it was during the school year. It wasn't the year the picture was taken. Oh, 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 yeah, okay, yeah, sure, that's interesting. Um, after, after the picture was taken, um, the picture is taken as Elizabeth is heading to the bus stop. Elizabeth, as I say, has been rebuffed three times already. She can't get into the school, and the mob has gathered behind her, and she realizes that there's another, she could turn around and go back to the bus stop where, that she, where she'd, alighted from the bus, or she, she knew that there was another bus stop a couple blocks away. The school takes up two city blocks. The school's this very long building, but there was another bus stop ahead. And so um, she, gets, she walks those two blocks with the mob behind her, and there's a bench there. And she's sitting on the bench all by herself. There's a picture in the book. I mean, it just breaks your heart. It, you know, just sitting there all by herself. But there were a couple of people, there were several people who came up to her, actually. I mean, at one point, Daisy Bates' husband, the, the, hus the, the publisher of the local black paper, came up to her and said, do you want me to take you out of here? But Elizabeth came from a very old-fashioned family, and she knew that her mother would not want her to be with an older man that she didn't know. And he, he pulled up his jacket and showed her that he had a gun, a black man carrying a gun. It was a very ama amazing thing. But she wouldn't go with him. All right, that's not who you're asking about. He was one of the people who came up to her. Um, another person who came up to her was the reporter for the New York Times, a guy named Benjamin Fine. He was the education writer for the, for the Times. I worked in the Times for 15 years, so I'm very interested in the Times connection here. Um, and the Times underestimated the importance of the Little Rock story. So it sent this kind of fuddy-duddy education writer with a bow tie down there to cover what was really a war zone, all right? And he got in trouble. Um, he became sort of a lightning rod, but what really got him in trouble, apart from sort of being over his head journalistically, was that he saw Elizabeth sitting on the bench by herself, a white guy, see, spots this black girl sitting by herself, and he goes, he, he sits next to her, and he tries to ask her some questions and she's crying and he puts his arm around her 
and he, he's the father of three daughters himself who were about Elizabeth's age, and he puts his arm around her and he says, don't let them see you cry. And the crowd starts jeering for a white man to be touching a black girl, you know, it was very, very unsouthern and inflammatory, and everybody starts shouting at him and calling him a nigger lover and all of this. And shortly thereafter, he was pulled off the story, in part because he was over his head, but also in part because he'd become a lightning rod. And they brought in the guy who, who had been covering the Korean War to cover the story. That's who they really needed there. But he gave an interview many years later in which somebody said, was it, you know, and this is something I would discuss with my journalism students. Somebody asked him, you know, was it appropriate for you as a reporter to do this? And he said, a reporter has to be a human being, my dear. That was his answer. That was his way of, you know, um, that was his way of, of, of reacting to the situation. The third woman, the third person who came up to him, to, to Elizabeth, also a very interesting story. She was um, a former school teacher named Elizabeth, named Lorch, Grace Lorch. Um, she and her husband were communists. They had lost, he had lost a number of teaching positions because of his position on civil rights. For those of you who know New York, he was, he was at the center of the campaign to integrate Stuyvesant Town, all right? He was a professor at City College and he lost his job because he tried to integrate Stuyvesant Town. This is the kind of guy he was. And then he, rent, he sublet his apartment in, Stuy, in, in, Stuy, in, in Stuyvesant Town to a black couple while he worked at Penn State where he had to go find a job after he lost the city college job. And then he was fired from Penn State for subletting his apartment to a black person. So his career took a downward spiral, and he ended up in Little Rock, teaching at the black school in Little Rock. It was the only place in the United States that would hire him, all right? And this was his wife um, who sat down next to Elizabeth and shouted at the crowd, six months from now, you're all going to be ashamed of what you're doing. And she was the one that escorted Elizabeth to the bus when the bus finally came. But it's a sign of how tough Elizabeth is and why she has the relationship with Hazel that she does, that Elizabeth thought that Grace Lorch just agitated the crowd by hectoring them and shouting at them. She only made it worse. She wanted her off the bus. She didn't want her help and, and had very little use for her for the last 50 years. Um, and uh, Elizabeth is very tough even on the people who try to help her. And after, after that, the, the Lorches lost their job at the black school in Little Rock because the black school got white money and they, and they were too radioactive. And they moved to Canada. And I spoke to their daughter, and their daughter said that the mother never recovered from that experience and died, and died relatively young. The, fa the father is still around. He's like 95 or 96. But those were the people who tried to comfort Elizabeth that day. And... Um, there's one more brief story that I'll tell about them, which is that their daughter told me that one night in their, I mean, there were fire bombs and, you know, bur, you know things thrown at their house and windows broken and stuff for what they did. Um, and one night there was, a, there, was, there was a knock on the door and they didn't know who it was and, they, you know, they were very afraid to get the door, but it turned out to be a black man at the door who worked at the local post office and he wouldn't come in until they turned off all the lights so that no one could see that he was going to visit them. And when he got in, he emptied out a bag of mail, fan mail that they had gotten from around the country, people saying, you did the right thing, you know, how heroic of you to go up and sit next to that black girl. The local post office was not going to deliver the mail to them. Um, and it was about to be returned, and this black worker at the post office rescued the letters that were about to be sent back to the senders and brought it to their house. So this is, I mean, it's, everywhere you turn, there's something very powerful in, 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 in the story. Uh, 